Okay, this is David McKinster again. Uh, the topic now is going to be Plato, the Navigator, and Related Analogies. If you're in my intro philosophy class, this lecture covers um, the first set of readings in Plato, The Prejudice Against Philosophy. There is a study guide that will be noted on your syllabus that you should look at that summarizes some of this and asks you some questions about it. Okay? Um, as this section begins, Glaucon and Adamantus have been talking with Socrates, and they say, well, you know, if, if it's such a, such a worthwhile thing to do to pursue philosophy, why don't ordinary people understand that philosophy is to their benefit? And Socrates says, well, you know, they're right in thinking it's useless or dangerous insofar as anything's useless if you don't use it. It doesn't matter how much potential it has. If you don't use it, it's no good. How many people know someone who has purchased an expensive piece of exercise equipment and then used it as a clothes horse? Okay, it happens all the time. I've known any number of people who will go to the doctor, get a prescription, take a, a couple of times, and then have it sitting on the shelf and say, I don't understand why I'm not getting any better. Um, well, you know, if you don't use it, it does you no good. Okay? Uh, any more than if you buy a whole slew of, of good books and put them on your bookshelf, that's not going to make you any more knowledgeable unless you actually read them and think about them. Okay? So most people don't have any idea how to use love of wisdom as part of their own lives, how to navigate through their own lives using that as a compass. Now I'm going to uh, mention, probably a few times in the course, an analogy that Plato uses in a different dialogue, the Phaedrus, about the self being like a chariot. The chariot is pulled by three horses, appetite, passion, and reason. There's nothing wrong with appetite. Appetite keeps us alive. If we didn't have appetite for rest and for activity, we'd, we'd grow lethargic and die. If we didn't have an appetite for food and for drink, we'd wither up and die. If we didn't have an appetite for sex, there would be no new generation. Appetites actually are good if they are well managed and they are healthy appetites. They are appetites for things which will actually uh, make us stronger, more robust, and healthier. Okay, so that's the difference between an appetite, say, and an, an addiction. Um, nothing wrong with appetite, but appetite is, as well as being a strong horse, it is a horse that is not capable of steering the chariot. Because appetite, left on its own, will just go right for what it wants. Okay? I had a cat for about 13 years, and every morning I would sit down on the floor and begin to open a can of wet food, and the cat would reach up and start trying to push the can down to the floor with her paw. So I would let her do it, and then she'd realize the can's not open. And she'd just look at me like, what's going on? And I'd pick it up and start opening it again, and very anxious, she'd start pushing it down again. And I would let her do that until I got bored with it. <laughs> And actually, what I was hoping was that one day she would figure out, I'm going to get the wet food sooner if I don't do that. But in fact, she couldn't figure that out. She was just being driven by her appetite. I want that wet food, that wet food. And in fact, acting in a way that made it uh, more difficult for her to actually get to the food. Okay? Appetite isn't able to steer the chariot. Appetite gives a lot of energy and power to the chariot, but it doesn't, it's not capable of steering. The same is true about passion. If we don't care about anything, we won't do anything. We won't even do anything about our appetites if we don't care <laughs> about them. Okay? A complete lack of caring essentially means that we've fallen into a deep clinical depression and we're, we are going to die. Okay? It's not enough to simply have appetites. You ha also have to care about something. Okay? Passion gives a lot of energy to the chariot, but again, it has to be a healthy passion. It has to be a well-managed passion, one that works for the benefit of the chariot and not against it. Passion will take us right off the road into the river, into the rocks, destroy the chariot, as will appetite, if it's, not, uh, if, if it's put in charge of steering. You never tether appetite and passion out in front. What do you tether out in front? Reason. Reason, Plato says, is, the, not, is not a strong horse. It is the weakest of the three. But its virtue is that it is capable of steering. 
It's capable of weighing alternatives. It's capable of foreseeing consequences. It's capable of making reasonable choices. So he says, be sure that you always have reason tethered out in front. It's not like you can live without appetite and passion, nor should you. Reason alone isn't enough. No matter what it is we realize, if we don't want anything and we don't care about anything, we won't do anything about it. Okay? The important thing is to have every element of the self healthy and doing its proper job. Okay? Just a historical note, Sigmund Freud points back to this explicitly and says, it's really, you know, to a large extent, Plato who inspired me to think of the self as being uh, this, you know, a set of dynamic processes that have to work together. And out of this, he creates this notion of the id, the ego, and the superego, which is not exactly like this idea, but has its historical roots here. Okay, so Plato gives us a series of four analogies to try to explain why philosophy might be seen as useless or dangerous by ordinary people. Okay? By ordinary people, he just means exactly that, ordinary people, like me, like you. And of course, since it's Socrates, he means like himself as well. You have a ship. In this first analogy, you have a ship. The captain of the ship is a little bigger and stronger than everybody else. Typically, you know, at this period of time, the captain of the ship would be the person who owns the ship, so he's got a sense of entitlement to run the ship, to steer the ship. That sense of entitlement is a matter of ownership. It's a, not a matter of, you know, he's extremely well qualified to run the ship, but it's his. But he will do with it what he wants to. Essentially, when you have a society that is an oligarchy, you oftentimes have people who are captains because they uh, fall into a position of entitlement. Oligarchy is ruled by a small privileged elite. Okay? Interestingly enough, and this is something that we should, you should comp, uh, contemplate as you're thinking about the implications of this material, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Cicero in the Roman Republic, Benjamin Franklin at the beginning of, uh, of our Republic, worried about democracy degenerating into, into an oligarchy. As uh, Cicero put it very eloquently, if only a small number of people have the material means to fully participate in the political process, you're only a democracy on paper. In fact, you're being run by a small, privileged group of people. Okay? Uh, lots of contemporary social thinkers have said, you know what, we've, we've fallen into that ourselves. Okay? Benjamin Franklin was very worried about this. When, he was, uh, when the Constitution was first drafted, Franklin wasn't invited to be a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. Why? As he was kind of like Socrates, he would have been asking the embarrassing questions and pointing out the embarrassing inconsistencies they wanted to, they wanted to just get done. So Franklin, however, who was in town for <laughs> the occasion, was asked by an elderly woman, Sir, what have you given us? And Franklin replied, a, repu a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And then he went on to say how every democracy, every republic in history had fallen. And the elderly woman asked him, but sir, why is that? And he said, I do not know, madam, but I suppose it is because of the eventual corruption of the people. Okay, again, words to ponder. So you have someone who thinks he's entitled to the ship, he owns the ship, and he's at the helm, but he doesn't necessarily really do a very good job of running that ship. As a result, the crew begins to grumble. They begin to say, and I know you've never heard people grumbling about our political leaders, right? <laughs> they begin to say, you know, I could probably steer the ship as well as this guy. Why should he get to steer the ship? They start forming little conspiratorial groups to try to use flattery or bribery or force or whatever means necessary to get control of the wheel. As they do that, they start neglecting their own jobs. Okay? If you ever work in the corporate world, you'll probably immediately run into the phenomenon known as corporate politics. Uh, I was, uh, I, for more than 20 years, had one foot in, in the academic world and one foot in the corporate world. And 
it is amazing. If you've never experienced it, you can't, you can't comprehend how thick the politics is and how much of the time and energy actually goes into the politics rather than actually doing the work, let alone doing it right. Okay? That's true in many, many, many institutions. So <clears throat> here you have people <laughs> neglecting their jobs, neglecting their own craft because they, they want control, they want power. And they may have legitimate gripes against the captain, but that doesn't mean that they are any more qualified than he is to, to run the ship. If you ever go to Plymouth and see the reconstruction of the Mayflower, it's, it's a very enlightening experience. You see, there are so many little jobs people had. One thing that really impressed me was there was a fire pit on the upper deck where the blacksmith forged metal pieces when they needed to, to repair metal pieces. And I thought, this is a wooden ship out in the middle of the ocean. And a blacksmith actually knows how to make that fire in that fire pit in the upper deck without burning the ship down and yet hot enough so that he can do his job. That guy was a craftsman. He knew what he was doing. The people who rigged the sails, the people who did all the jobs that have to be done to make the ship uh, run, those people knew what they were doing. Plato's not suggesting that these crew members don't know anything or that what they, what they know is of no value or, or of lesser value than what anyone else knows. In another dialogue, Socrates actually expresses this, this concern very, very clearly. He says, when I talked with ordinary craftsmen, I thought at last I found a person of real knowledge. Someone tells me, I know how to make a copper pot. He knows what materials to get together. He knows what tools to use. He knows what to do. And by golly, when he's done, he's got a copper pot. He was right. He did know how to make a copper pot. The problem is, he starts thinking of himself as an expert. He is an expert at making copper pots, but now he's just generally thinking of himself as an expert. Hubris creeps up. <laughs> he starts thinking, well, I am an expert. My opinion is, of course, very worthwhile, even if it's about something of, of, of which I know very little. If I know how to make a copper pot, well, I also know how to run the government. I also know what the gods expect of us. I also know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, he knows how to make a copper pot. He doesn't necessarily know all that, other, all that other stuff. Maybe he could learn those other things, but the fact that he's an expert at making copper pots doesn't mean he's qualified to do any of the rest of that. So the crew is not qualified to run the ship either, but they may be able to take the ship, the, the, the wheel from the captain and run the ship. If they do that, Plato says, it's gonna become like a drunken pleasure cruise. Does that sound like fun? Well, remember, this is not like some sort of a carnival cruise line. This is a ship out in the sea, which is going to sink and lose all hands if people don't know how to do what, what they need to do, if the crew doesn't do their jobs, and if the person at the wheel doesn't know what he's doing. Okay? It is a life and death matter. The ship will sink. Now, all the time Plato, in making these analogies, is talking about not only the state, not only politics, the government, our social life. He's also talking about the self. Okay? Here's what I believe because I want to believe it. It makes me feel good to believe it. Here's what I want to be true. I hate these people, so they're bad. These people are my friends, so they're good. I find this entertaining, so it must, must be harmless. Somebody tells me that I should stop doing this and that because it's destructive. I don't want to. I'll believe whatever I want to believe. The crew is in charge. And I'm lumbering around in my life, failing to achieve what the possibilities I could achieve, and instead of that, simply lost at sea. Now there is also on board a navigator, someone who has actually studied the art of navigation. He doesn't know how to get and keep power. He knows how to plot the course. The other people looking at him say, this guy knows nothing practical. Look at him. He stands there staring at the stars and making notes about the stars. And he's studying the stars, the tides, you know, the, the winds, that sort of thing, the currents. Those are all things that have nothing to do with what he wants to be true, nothing to do with his self-interest. This is how it is. The ancient Greeks had a different idea of freedom from ours. I mean, we tend to think that freedom means I can do whatever I want to do. The Greeks saw that as chaos, and they didn't think that flailing about chaotically is any freedom worth having. For the ancient Greeks, the notion of freedom was you get a clear idea 
of what's real. You get a clear idea of how the world actually is so that you can act as effectively as possible in the world as it is. The navigator isn't saying, what do I want to be true? What do I want to believe? How do I promote my own interest on this ship? How do I get control of the wheel? He's saying, how does the sea, what can I actually know about the sea? What can I actually know about plotting our location from the stars? I have to be humble enough to learn the way the world is instead of saying, you know, I'm going to lead with my ego. And of course, because of that, the crew thinks this guy is worthless. He doesn't know anything about how to get control of the ship. He doesn't know anything about getting or keeping power. He's useless to us. Now, <clears throat> so of course, they think he's useless. And if he keeps annoying them, they'll probably say, look, there is no art of navigation. If there were an art of navigation, I'd know it, because after all, I'm an expert. I'm smart. I know how to get control of this ship, so I'm a smart guy. If there were an art of navigation, why wouldn't I already know it? Keep bug bugging us about this, and we'll cut your throat and throw you overboard. Okay, Plato will have a similar kind of image when he, in the allegory of the cave, which we'll look at about halfway through this course. So, the navigator, the navigator could advise the captain and make him a better captain. If the crew takes over the ship, the navigator could advise the crew so that they could actually steer the ship effectively. But they're not about to listen to him. He's useless as far as they're concerned. They don't know how to use him. I remember, and this, you know, I will use examples from all over the political spectrum and from all kinds of different traditions and so forth that I'm not, you know, neither advocating nor critiquing for any of them. They're just good examples. Um, I heard Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, talking once when he had, published, he had just published a book. Um, he's a very prominent environmental uh, attorney and environmental activist. And he was talking about when, his, uh, when, when Arnold Schwarzenegger was first elected governor of California. If you, if you don't realize this already, Schwarzenegger is by marriage to Maria Shriver related to the Kennedys. Okay. So apparently when Arnold Schwarzenegger was first elected governor, he called Robert Kennedy Jr. and he said, um, he said Robert, Kennedy did a much better Schwarzenegger than I do, Robert, I want to be the greatest environmental governor the country has ever seen. And I don't know what the hell to do. Get out here and help me. I thought, that's pretty cool, actually. And that, uh, that's actually a good example of what Plato thinks ought to happen. I'm in charge. I knew how to get power. And I'm also wise enough to realize I don't necessarily know what to do now that I have the power. I better get people around me who actually know what to do and listen to them. OK. Um, <clears throat> the plant. The plant analogy is, it's, it's twofold. It's very, very brief. If you're not reading carefully, you may miss it. It's only a few lines. But it is important. Um, and many students have actually found that it really resonated with them. Weeds will grow anywhere. They will grow on anything. They will grow on seemingly on nothing. But a valuable plant has to be taken care of. You have, to, you have to make sure that you pull out the weeds so they don't strangle it because weeds are aggressive. A valuable plant will grow anywhere. What Plato is saying is that this is the same with virtue and vice. Our vices will grow on whatever we feed them. They'll find a way to grow if we don't pull them out. Virtues, on the other hand, have to be cultivated. It's not going to happen by itself. We have to be conscious, and we have to care, and we have to make the effort. We're not just going to wake up one day and be navigators. <laughs> okay. Um, the dangerous beast. This is, um, this is a very powerful analogy. Uh, Plato was very worried about the fact that many politicians in his time are simply pandering to public opinion. They have no idea how to solve the problems. They do know who the public wants to scapegoat. They do know how to arouse the passions of the crowd, but they do not know what to do. Once they have the crowd behind them, all they know how to do is to be swept into power and then try to stay in power by placating the crowd. Um, this, is, um, this is like having a dangerous beast 
who is allegedly trained. And the trainer says, you know what, I've trained this beast. If I throw him some raw meat, he stops threatening me. Well, no, it's the other way around. The beast has trained the, the so-called trainer. I want some meat, and, I, and the trainer feeds me. Okay? Real leadership traditionally has meant that you have a vision of what can be done and how to do it. And you are able to articulate that vision to the people in such a way that you persuade them to follow you. Martin Luther King was an example of that. He was very, very good at that. Here is my dream. Here is my vision. And here is how we can achieve it. And to be so persuasive about it as to get people to follow him in that regard. Not, I'm going to take a poll, try to figure out what you already believe, and then try to convince you that I already believe what you already believe. Okay? <laughs> in other words, you're as clueless as everybody else about how to solve our problems? No, thank you. <clears throat> Carl Jung, the psychoanalyst, um, you may be familiar with him as someone who explored the psychology behind mythology, uh, the recurrence of myth mythological themes in popular culture, this sort of thing. Carl Jung talked about the shadow self. Our capacity for destruction, our capacity for hatred, for violence, for, all, for bias, for ignorance, for all these things. That is our shadow self. If we try to deny that it exists, it grows stronger. Shadows grow stronger in the dark until finally it's so strong that it strides forward and can't be stopped. Jung used this analogy to uh, describe the rise of Nazism, as well as describing what happens in someone's character when the person is denying, I know I'm not, I'm not capable of hating. I'm not capable of being greedy. I'm not capable of being biased. That kind of denial means that you're not dealing with your, own, with your own vices, with your own shortcomings. You're not able to pull out the weeds because you deny the weeds are there. And what happens? That shadow self becomes stronger and stronger and stronger until finally it destroys other parts of your life. It strides forward and it can't be stopped. Plato sees the dangerous beast as being exactly that. This is the dark side of democracy, if you will. Uh, some people have said Plato is, is anti-democracy. That's really a very, very incomplete and inaccurate uh, uh, representation. Plato, if you want to look at Plato's political views, which we're not going to do really in this course, you'd have to look at a number of different dialogues. His final statement about what a government should be like is you should have a strict constitution that constrains even the rulers, or especially the rulers. Every, there should be one law for everyone. You should separate you should have separation of powers because it's, a, it's an inherent conflict of interest to have the same people both making and enforcing the laws. You should have an elected legislature to make the laws and you should have term limits so that special interests don't become entrenched in those laws. And you should understand that the laws will have to be changed uh, constantly because the laws will only be as good as the people who make them, which means they will always have shortcomings. Okay, that's not exactly terribly radical. Plato's criticism of democracy is that his Athenian democracy doesn't really have those kinds of constraints. It turns very easily into rule by an angry mob. And as he describes it, an angry mob will always look for a leader. And when you finally find a, a sufficiently charismatic and clever leader who is empowered by that mob, you won't be able to get rid of him. And thus, virtually overnight, this unconstrained democracy can be transformed into tyranny. And tyranny, he says, is the most unjust, the worst form of government. Okay? Now, you've probably, in other classes, if you've read The Republic, read the whole business about the philosopher king having absolute power and all this sort of thing. Plato himself, in his letters to King Dionysius of Syracuse, says that's a parody. He's making fun of the Spartan government and how grotesque the Spartan political conceptions are. Okay? Um, the fact that he himself says it's parody has been ignored by a lot of people who want, to present it, uh, who want to present it as if it's meant literally and then say, well, look at Plato. Plato just wanted this incredible, like, theocracy or something. No, he didn't. He was mocking it. He was essentially trying to make the point you can't ever give total power to any human being because no hum human being is going to be perfectly wise and perfectly, perfectly benevolent. Okay, so <clears throat> the beast, again, as above, so below, <laughs> right, as the alchemist used to say, as above, so below. Just as there is a drunken crew member inside of me, 
I want to be careful just to be, not to simply give him the wheel of my life. I want to be careful not to let the dangerous beast, you know, step out and take over my life either. And the first thing I have to admit is that he's there. The potential is there. Okay, finally, the bald-headed tinker. The bald-headed tinker, a tinker is someone who really didn't have any specific craft. He mended common household items like pots and pans, for instance. This is one of the jobs that Socrates did when, when he worked. Okay? And he worked as much as he needed to to provide for himself and his family, and, but no more than that. Um, so a tinker is not a real craftsman, not a person who has really expert knowledge. What has happened in this analogy is that the tinker's old boss has got, fallen on hard times. The tinker's just gotten out of jail, and he says, well, you know what, if the boss is on hard times, I'm going to gussy myself up and go uh, you know, offer to marry his daughter. I mean, he's not going to have any better prospects. Well, says Socrates, look, this is what happens to philosophy. The people who have the talent, the charisma, the education to really be significantly uh, contributing to philosophy, they're all seduced away into other ends. You know, bribery, flattery, whatever. They're all seduced away from the love of wisdom. And that leaves philosophy with nothing better than a bald-headed tinker. Okay? Now, this is also self-effacement because he is himself a little bald-headed tinker. And he's saying, look, all these articulate, intelligent, attractive people who could really promote love of wisdom, they're all seduced away into unworthy ends. And that leaves philosophy with the likes of me, a grotesque little man who, who professes ignorance. Isn't that sad? Well, of course, we would add <laughs> at this point in history that uh, maybe it wasn't sad because as Plato and various others pointed out, Socrates was, in their estimation, the wisest and noblest and bravest man they had ever met, or as Plato put it, or am ever likely to meet. So, when you're writing about, when you're thinking about and writing about these analogies, two things to remember. One, as above, so below. This is not simply about how we run our government. This is also about how we run our lives. Also, this is not simply a critique of a historical situation that's 2,500 years old. This is something profound about human nature. Okay? One student years ago said to me, it's amazing to me that this was written so long ago because this could have been written yesterday and it would be just as compelling. Okay. Thank you.